Gravity is one of the most mysterious forces that pervaded mankind. From the time of Newton until now, what we can only do so far is to quantify gravity and describe its effect using equations. But to explain gravity in a fundamental level, there are many theories that divide the consensus of scientists. In fact, quantum mechanics cannot still reconcile the existence of gravitons, the quantum particles for gravity, with Einstein's general relativity. And as we all know, general relativity excellently explains the dynamics of astronomical bodies. In this discussion, we explore Newton's law of universal gravitation and how its compact equation explains wide range of phenomena and how it answers some questions that seem difficult to resolve using common sense. For example, why does the Earth remain on its orbit? In other words, why do celestial bodies do not fly off and why do they remain intact in their orbit? Why doesn't the moon fall to the earth? Etc. Let's start with Newton's universal law of gravitation. In 1687, along with his three laws of motion, Newton published the law of universal gravitation. This law states that every particle in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now the word universal here means that this law works for any kind of two objects that have mass. Whether we are talking about two-point particles with mass m1 and m2, or two extended objects like a sphere or a cube, this law works accurately. When you have an extended object like this, you can measure the distance between them by assuming that mass is concentrated at their geometric center. This is valid as long as the objects have uniform density and one object is not contained in another object. Newton's universal law works well with everything in the universe be it an apple and the planet Earth, or the moon and the Earth. Every object in the universe exerts gravity on one another no matter how far away they are with each other. Based on experiments, if either of the mass m1 or m2 is increased, gravitational force increases as well. Mathematically speaking, this means that gravitational force is directly proportional to mass m1 and m2. Also, when the distance between the objects is increased, gravitational force decreases dramatically. Experiments reveal that gravitational force is an inverse square law. To turn this proportionality symbol into an equal sign, we need to multiply the expression with a constant. This constant is what we call the gravitational constant. The numerical value of the gravitational constant was determined when Henry Cavendish performed an experiment in 1978. The apparatus consisted of two metal spheres, each with small mass m, connected to the ends of a metal rod suspended by a thin metal wire. Near the small spheres, two large metal spheres, each with mass capital M, are placed. Because of the attractive force or gravitational force between the smaller and larger spheres, the rod rotates which causes the wire to twist. The angle of rotation was measured with a light beam reflected from a mirror attached from the vertical suspension. The experiment was repeated with different masses at various separation distances r. After many careful measurements, the value of gravitational constant g was found to be g equals 6.673 times 10 raised to negative 11 newton times meter squared over kilogram squared. And now that we have established the equation that governs gravitational attraction between any two objects, let us explore one application that provides mathematical description of planets and satellites. And I'm talking about Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler's first law states that each planet moves in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. To visualize this, let's review the geometry of an ellipse. An ellipse has two focus points or foci. 
the sum of the distances from f to point p and from f prime to point p is the same for all points on the curve. The major axis of the ellipse has a length of 2a. So basically, the semi-major axis has a length of a. And the semi-minor or semi-minor axis has a length of b. Kepler's first law tells us that the sun is at one of the foci, not at the middle of the ellipse. The distance of each focus from the center of the ellipse is E times A. Here, E refers to what we call eccentricity. It is a dimensionless number between 0 and 1. If E equals 0, then the ellipse collapses into a circle. The equation of ellipse is given by x squared over A squared plus y squared over B squared equals 1. And in polar coordinates, the equation takes this form. Newton showed that if the attractive force is proportional to 1 over r squared, then the possible closed orbit is in the form of an ellipse. You may skip the following derivation of Kepler's first law from Newton's laws. I just included it in case you are curious. Kepler's second law states that a line drawn from the sun to any planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. As an example, let's examine the differential area swept by line FP. After small time interval dt, not shown here, the line moves through an angle d theta. If we look at this small area shown by this shaded region, it looks like a triangle with height r and base r d theta. Kepler's second law tells us that no matter where the planet is along the elliptical orbit, it will always sweep the same area for a fixed time interval. Now you may skip the following derivation of Kepler's second law from conservation of angular momentum. Again, I just included it in case you are curious. Kepler's third law states that 
The periods of the planets are proportional to the three halves powers of the major axis lengths of their orbits. Mathematically, this simply tells us that the square of the period of the planets is directly proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. You may skip the following derivation of Kepler's third law from Newton's laws. Similarly, I just included it to satiate your curiosity. Let's try this sample problem. In early experiments, the Earth's radius was determined to be 6.38 times 10 raised to 6 meters. Calculate the approximate value of the Earth's mass. Since our target quantity is the Earth's mass, we need an equation where the Earth can interact with another object. And I'm talking about Newton's universal law of gravitation. Recall that any kind of weight is essentially a force due to Earth's influence or gravity, so we can equate the two expressions. And from here, the mass of any object cancels out. And we can rearrange this in terms of our target quantity. Plugging in the given in SI units, the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 raised to 24 kilograms. Let's consider one more example. Diwata 1 is the Philippines first microsatellite. In order to get consistent GIS signal, the satellite must remain in the same location with respect to the surface of the Earth. For this to happen, the satellite must be at a height such that it has the same period of one revolution as that of the Earth. In this case, period equals 24 hours. Determine this height with respect to the surface of the Earth. Here, our target variable is the radial distance of the satellite from the Earth. As I mentioned earlier, radial distances are assumed to be measured from the center of an object. And since we're supposed to measure the distance starting from the surface, we have to calculate the radial distance first, and then subtract the distance from the center to the surface to this radial distance. What keeps satellite in its orbit is the centripetal force due to Earth's gravity. In this equation, notice that we don't have a value for the speed v, and we're actually given a value for period. Now, the expression that connects speed and period is the speed of an object in uniform circular motion. So we plug it here, and rearranging, we now have a value for the radial distance r. Our next goal is to subtract the radius of the earth to this r to get the distance from the surface of the earth. Plugging in the values in SI units, the height from the surface of the Earth is 3.59 times 10 raised to 7 meters. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel.